Hello folks, my name is Dr. Zachary Hildenbrand. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Kevin Shug, and we are the Collaborative Laboratories for Environmental Analysis and Remediation at the University of Texas at Arlington. We're coming to you from the uh, Responsible Shale Energy Extraction Conference, which is a very unique event, bringing together scientists, concerned citizens, operators, regulators, and technology companies to have an honest series of conversations about environmental stewardship in shale energy. We'd really like to thank the support of the Cynthia and George Mitchell Foundation and Earth Day Texas for allowing us to put on this event. Uh, we believe that this content that we're going to be providing to those who haven't been able to attend is going to help answer and educate a lot of questions surrounding responsible shale energy extraction. So we hope you enjoy the content. Buchanan from Texas Land and Mineral Owners Association. We have Kevin Shug, uh, our fearless leader at CLEAR at UT Arlington. And we have Jim Schirmbeck from the Downwinders at Risk. And this is all going to be moderated by Jennifer Hiller of the San Antonio Express News. Uh, let's all welcome them uh, to this exciting discussion. All right, thanks for joining us today. Um, I guess I'll just jump into this and hopefully we'll have some time for audience questions as well. With us being several years into shale development in Texas, and we've gone through a huge boom and maybe have another boom going on in the Permian right now, uh, from each of your perspectives, I'm just kind of wondering how you think things are going, if this is, if this is working, if we have the regulations we need in place, um, if maybe from Kevin's perspective, if there's enough science being done, and, and just kind of you think how, how you think we are doing as a state. Okay. Uh, so. We've, we started doing research on this topic in, in 2011, and I, I would, I'll admit at that point I was quite new to the whole topic itself, and there, it was clear up until 2013 there was virtually nothing in the literature. I mean, that really, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, 2011, so around that time there was really some of the very first pieces of literature that were coming out, in, at least in terms of analysis of, of potential environmental impact. Um, you know, so the first paper we published in 2013, we think was kind of, you know, among one of the first big studies and it got a lot of attention and, and we've built from there and, and there's been a lot more work that's being done. So the amount of work that's increased, at least from the science side, at, the amount of work that's being done has increased significantly from the science side, um, but I would say it's still not anywhere near where it should be. Um, so, the, you know, that not nearly, we don't get nearly as much let's say, hype or, or whatever over uh, at work that we might put out now as we did you know, a few years ago. And maybe that's a good thing because people are kind of starting to understand the issues, but I still think that, you know, as I sit here and we have this type of a discussion, that the, the lines of communication aren't completely open. Uh, I think we, we really have to still have those uh, close interactions between you know, industry, third-party analysts, regulators. Uh, I, I see that developing. Uh, we've had, we're having a great opportunity now to work together with Apache as a great example, um, but I think it's just, that type of, of concept is just starting. Good deal. Anybody else want to jump in on that? Sure. <laughs> uh, you, I think you said it, but to put it in context, in the last 10 years, the landscape in Texas has changed quite dramatically. And you see not just uh, an uptick in the number of wells being drilled, the number of permits being drilled, uh, but also the level, the, the differences in new technology and how they're being applied, and um, and the, the concentration of those of those technologies and that activity in different regions. So this is this is a this is a very rapidly changing environment around us. There is a lot of research that's done, and a lot of a lot of great research out of our academic institutions like Texas A and M and the University of Texas. Um, UT Arlington um, as well. So we're, we're, we're getting good data there. The Railroad Commission is also working with individual groups who are doing research like the BEG, uh, Scott Tinker who just presented. Um, at the end of the day though, look, there is still much opportunity for us to research. There's been a lot of dialogue around um, what might be the connection between disposal wells and seismicity. There's certainly areas of the state where we are concerned that the risks of that connection is high. We're studying that areas of the state where we probably don't think it's happening and the state has allocated millions of dollars to gather more data uh, railroad commission not personally participating in that so 
when you see this, this lens, just like any industry, when things are changing so quickly, yeah, there's room, a lot of room for us to gather new data, help us understand what's happening and what's not happening so that people, one, so that we're making sure things are safe, but two, just so people are informed and they they're feel comfortable that, okay, yeah, now that we know what's happening in different areas, we know the areas to focus on and know the areas we shouldn't focus on. Good deal. We know there was a, a public meeting last night in this area about a, a controversial disposal well that, that might be going in near Lake Arlington. Um, you know, when you have, you know, a, a, you show up at these public meetings and, and kind of go into the belly of the beast. It, it seems like in Texas there's not an awesome setup for, for dealing, it seems like the permit process is very technical and then you have kind of the human aspect of people who are worried about earthquakes or traffic or all of these things that don't fit into like a, a check in the box. Um, and, and I thought that each of you may have a different perspective on kind of how we handle that or if there needs to be, you know, any, any kind of changes made to uh, the permitting process or a hearings process or something that, you know, considers some of those issues that, that aren't necessarily technical, but sometimes they are. We had that in place before 2015, but the state took that away from home rule cities, at least, the power to do that kind of thing. So if Dallas and Fort Worth still had its way, they would be regulating those activities, and this wouldn't even be an issue. It would be a zoning problem left up to the local authorities. The state and the RRC think they can do a better job of this, and so taking that power away from all the cities, and they don't have that opportunity more to have. I, I do want to say, in terms of the status of thing, what I've seen on the ground is we look at it from an air impact point of view, and what Mr. Tinker said was all true from the production end when you actually burn the gas, but if you're in the mining of gas, as we are, we're kind of the original Appalachia of gas, it's not clean. If you live by a compressor, there's quite a bit of NOx and PM coming off of that compressor. In fact, the state's own air quality modeling shows that well, and natural gas have a big impact. Those sources have a big impact on air monitors that are the worst performing ones in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. They contribute to smog. And yet, the oil and gas industry is exempted from the same kind of offsets that every other industry is forced to apply in a smoggy area. They are exempted from this. They're also exempted now from zoning rules. It's an oil and gas exceptionalism. Everything for the other, other industries is not okay for us. We're not abiding by those rules. We need special rules. This is what we've seen in the last two or three years as they get more desperate to kind of keep the cities and frankly groups like ours from interfering with production. They want to have more control out of Austin and less control at the local level. And I think that's what's really taking place. Is there is a rapidly changing environment. It's a rapidly changing political environment. Yeah, it certainly seems like the House Bill 40 is, is running up against um, that disposal well permit. It shouldn't even be an issue because it, it was part of a model ordinance that the industry and the RRC cited in, in 2015 as being an example that everyone should follow. The ban on injection wells was in the ordinance at that time. The RRC should be not should be withdrawing, forcing this permit to be withdrawn on that basis alone. It was already in place and a part of that permit. So I made a couple of statements, and I appreciate the the passion that you show for this. And you brought up the human element a minute ago. And look, everything starts with a human element. And if we don't appreciate that, not as politicians or activists or academics, if, if we don't start with, okay, how do people feel about what's happening in their neighborhood, in their communities, in their state, in their environment, um, then we're, we're missing the point. Because but that's what's great about these monitors. They don't have emotions. They just record numbers, and the numbers say that the activities of the oil and gas industry are actually contributing to small. Are you done? Yeah. Okay. Um, what I was going to say is you have to start off with that, and, and anybody who is is frustrated or disappointed or concerned, uh, we need to respond to that. And that is absolutely an area that the Railroad Commission uh, needs to improve on and we're working to improve on that. And that's why you, you mentioned the town hall I did last night. You said belly of the beast. Uh, I knew exactly what I was walking into. There were, I don't know, a hundred, couple hundred people there that were very concerned. And at the end of the day, my, my statutory responsibilities are to make sure that this thing is safe. And I was very public about the fact, if, I'm not, if I don't know that it's safe, I'm gonna vote against it. My job is to make sure that it's safe, 
uh, or at least do everything I can to make sure that it's safe. And that's not going to make everybody feel good, but it's a step in that direction. And being there and having those conversations with a group and individually with people about what are, our pra what are the practices that we require. And we look at surface casing, then long string casing, and then conductor casing, and intermediate casing, all the layers of concrete that go around that, and help people understand things that they haven't seen before. Um, not trying to convince anybody, but at least give them a sense of, okay, th there is a lot that goes into it. Um, the, the, the HB 40, which I as a railroad commissioner don't, don't, I don't decide that, that's the legislature, but once it's decided, I have a responsibility to the people I work for, which is everybody in Texas, to, to, to act on that. And some of the things that were said just now, I'm not sure were exactly accurate, you know, well, it wasn't that. accurate. You say that a lot. I know I went to that forum last night. You say that a lot when you disagree with something, but you don't say what's inaccurate. Can you point out what was inaccurate, what I said? I will. Thank you for that. Um, the, the fact that, oh, all ordinances, all that ability has been taken away. Setbacks are still in place. Uh, cities and, and municipalities can put setbacks in to say, well, these can't be in certain distances, within certain distances, certain areas. Um, that is not true. They, they're afraid right now of changing anything in their ordinance for fear of HB 40. Let me give you a great example of air quality. We want cities to phase out diesel and gas-powered compressors and electrify them. This is an industry standard practice that you might have read about in the textbooks that oil and gas industry supply colleges. They actually suggest this idea as a way to deal with air quality uh, in smoggy areas. And so we want this to happen at the local uh, level, at the ordinance level. But the cities now are so afraid of implementing anything new because of HB 40. They're, they interpret the law as saying they cannot even implement technology that was in place in 2015 that was commonplace, like electrification of compressors. Fort Worth says they can't even do that now because of HB 40. So a technology that was already in place and in widespread use for this very purpose in 2015 cannot be expanded under HB 40 according to their interpretation of the law and what they've heard from the state. So it freezes everything in place. There are no, no new setbacks. This permit by Bluestone is the first provocation since HB 40 passed of anyone. There's not been any municipal activity at all that challenged it. This is the first time it's been challenged, and it's been challenged by industry. It's a stupid challenge, I think, because it goes after Fort Worth, which is one of your best municipal friends, or was, until this. But you're saying that things can change under this law. They cannot. I'm telling you, the cities are afraid as hell to change anything. It is frozen in place. I'd love that to change, and I'd love you to speak up in favor of changing that. But right now, it ain't happening. Can I pause for a second? One of the challenges we have in, in the political dynamic is that it's so, so it's all vitriol, right? You want to go in, you want to have a, a you want to have an educated discussion, you want to have, a, um, and I get that it's difficult when people are concerned. I live in Friendswood, there's oil wells and pipelines going through my neighborhood. Um, and it is, it's sad that we can't have the kind of conversations. Look, let's understand where we make improvements. This is my home state. I grew up in Irving, um, went to high school in Irving. My parents are both teachers in Irving. Um, and, and yet when you try, to, you try to voice ideas. No, and, you just misinterpreted the law. It was a point of fact I was disagreeing with, not your opinion. You can have opinions all day long, but it was your interpretation of HB 40 that I was disagreeing with. I'd like to have a, a civil, I'd like to have civil discussion. That's why I'm here, that's why I'm in this job. I get that that's not what you want to do here today. That is what I want to do. I want you to come out and say, that is not at all what we meant by HB 40. We want cities to have the opportunity to adapt and change their local laws to adapt to that technology that's already there. We'd love for you to say that. But right now the RRC is a, a regressive force in this state, not a progressive force for change. And I just think that that should change. You seem to be a hipper, younger version of the GOP, and so you should know that this is where the mess is. You've got to find a way out of this mess, out of this corner that y'all put yourselves in, with nobody doing it. The cities are afraid to move. And you can't freeze in place 2015 regulations when the industry is moving along, the technology is moving along, Extraction methods are moving along, but we're all staying in 2015 in terms of the regulation. That doesn't make any sense at all. I'm sorry that I can't complete the thought today, folks. I'd like to. Uh, 
Um, and if we don't get a chance to that today because of the, di the dynamic up here, I will stick around and have conversations with anybody that would like to. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry that things are this negative. I would hope that they wouldn't have been that way. Uh, okay. That's, look, all I can tell you is the job I'm in today, the job I've been doing for two years. Um, there is, when people ask me, what, what, what would be my incentive to lie to anybody? What would be my incentive to Because be you get paid by the industry you regulate. That is a lie. That is a lie. You get paid that donations to your, con you get okay, elected. Well, I, I get, people that you yes, I get donations, but when you misconstrue it and say, I get paid by industry, that is a bold-faced lie. For many of us, the nuance is, is not there. When you get 60% of your contributions from the industry that you regulate, and in fact, you took contributions from an injection well that was seeking a permit in Fort Worth or Azel not more than two years ago, you took contributions from this facility that was seeking a permit from you. You didn't even recuse yourself. How do you call yourself an environmentalist? When you do stuff like that. <laughs> like I said, sorry that we can't have a better discourse today. You just can't debate with the opposition. Just if you'd like to use oh, this media debate. training that you have. Last night was a great course of media training. But um, when you get into a real debate, you can't handle what the opposition throws at you well, in let, terms of facts. Let's let the commissioner finish his thought. Thank you. Thank you. I think I can do it. But there's a difference between us. I want to respect your ideas and your concerns, and I want to hear them. You obviously don't. No, you don't. I don't think you do. Or otherwise, you would have acted on them by now. You've had time in office to act on those concerns. I don't know what you'd like us to do here today. I want to have constructive dialogue, <laughs> but maybe it's better if I don't participate so that he will stop doing what can he's doing. Well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll let the other people speak. I just, I, you Please say do. that I point, you, you're, the original charge was that I was pointing out things that were an error, and I asked you to correct those, and you could not, so I'll, that's fine. I haven't had a chance. Let me, Love to can, have I, a chance. can I weigh in here? I mean, I, you know, I, I will say from a, uh, I, I'm fairly politically naive. I'm not uh, afraid to admit that. I'm, I'm more interested in the science and, and doing something interesting, but it's, uh, it's very, and so, I, you know, what I, what I comment on here is, is definitely a perception, and, and I won't even speak uh, to the details that you're saying here, but it, it seems to me, I hear anecdotally enough, and, and this goes back well before you were at the Railroad Commission, that you know, if an event happened um, where you know, the Railroad Commission is meant to investigate that and then maybe bring in TCEQ, um, it, it doesn't feel like that the, the transparency is there to communicate the findings, I guess almost, in a, I will say, in a, in a believable fashion to the public, that I think a very constructive uh, thing to, would be to consider you know, how, how can you involve a multiple, you know, third party uh, groups? I mean, I, I can speak for CLEAR as, as one very interested in, in being involved in trying to understand whether, you know, you know, did an event happen? What's the extent of that? Uh, but that kind of transparency and communication, I think, would go a long way to, um, let's say, easing some of the, the past, uh, at least what I perceived, kind of, you know, the past uh, perceptions of, you know, railroad commission being a, a, a monger, and, and a, you know, I, I, you know what I'm saying. Oh, I, look, I, there's, so I, this is my outside view looking in, and, and uh, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm in now in the middle of it, but that, that's what, that's how I see it. It's just not transparent enough what's happening. There's no question, and I agree that we have we have a perception problem, and and we have a, someone says I think there's a history problem, right? And there's we have to get we have to work now to get past that, and part of that is. How do we share information in a way that's more timely, uh, in which we do engage outside groups? I mentioned the BEG, your group, CLEAR, UT Arlington, other academic groups, because wouldn't, you know, if you were a citizen living in an area, and if you've had concerns in the past, and there's a railroad commission finding, and then you also hear that, oh, by the way, uh, you know, Rice University did a study on this, or UT Arlington, and, and here's how they collaborated. I do think that's an opportunity to improve. And that is something that I said we're working with BEG right now, and especially on this issue of seismicity, in a way that we are working together, validating each other's work, sharing data more real time. Uh, very, you're, you're saying this is exactly right. And that, at the end of the day, man, it sure would be a better situation. The, the, the landscape would be better if people did have some confidence, but I recognize we've got to work to get that. And so the, your comments hit home very well. Do you think that the agency needs more more people, more... Absolutely. I, I know technology has been a big issue. Do you think you need more more people, more inspectors? There's 
to keep up with the amount of activity that we're seeing? We absolutely do, and uh, we've been very public about that. We only have about 150 inspectors on staff right now. Um, if we were at our full capacity, it would be about 250. We ran into budget issues in uh, 2014 and 2015, and then in 2016 and 17, uh, because the industry, we were predominantly funded by industry fees, and as industry activity was going down, we ran into a revenue problem. But the legislature has been very supportive of us expanding the agency and, and get, getting more people to do exactly that so that we can witness more tests, publish data more real time. Uh, you mentioned technology, it's a big area for us. And we've learned a lot about how we've developed technology over the last couple of years and the years before that. And how can we develop things so that if a landowner uh, or even just something in the community, if they don't own that particular piece of land, can say, I'd like to know with, with this well, what's happening today? What's the production look like? Whose well is it? And what's the history there? What tests were done? It's hard to look that up on our website today. It's hard for me to look it up, and I'm, I am not how to do it. So all of those are things that we are, we're, we're trying to make advances in, and we recognize those are opportunities to improve, and that that would help people of the state feel more confident about the things that we would do. One thing I was hoping to hear you guys talk about is eminent domain, which has been uh, a topic of discussion at the legislature, and there's been obviously a lot of pipeline development across the state. And it, you know, it's not just an oil and gas issue, but I thought that Laura would have a good perspective to share about, uh, you know, what are landowners and ranchers talking about in terms of eminent domain, and, and what concerns do they have about how the process works right now? Um, so we do have a very concerted effort this session uh, for some meaningful eminent domain reform. Uh, at this point, the process just seems pretty unbalanced and landowners find that they feel that they're not really getting a fair shake in how it works. Um, they end up having to, if they don't accept an offer, then they're stuck with a lot of expense with, you know, being sued for a condemnation hearing and all of that. Um, we're trying to make some changes that'll balance it out, not to put an end to eminent domain. We understand this is going to happen, it's necessary, we need infrastructure. However, there has to be a way to make that whole process more fair for landowners who are really impacted by this in, in sometimes a very severe way. Definitely. Um, I don't know if, if anybody else wants to talk eminent domain. I find it to be a fascinating issue. Um, because it is a position where you you have such a difference in opinion usually between the industry and, and the landowner that they're dealing with. I, I, so I mean I have I grew up in Virginia and uh, there's there's a pipeline that's supposed to go right through the farm that I grew up on, and um, people are going crazy over it. And you know that's I you know maybe they have some. There's certainly obviously the, the whole issue of pipeline nationwide is a huge one right now but I, I honestly think when I talk to my sister who still lives there and um, there's a there's a lot of uh, um, let's say fear that may not uh, that may be totally justified but it, it's uninformed that I, I don't think there's a clear communication to the public in general not made not just about pipelines but in general about what are the risks? I mean, we heard some great things this morning about those risks, but I don't think that message is being clearly uh, conveyed. And I don't know what all the right fashions are, but it, it, it's not being clearly conveyed to people so that they can be informed and not jump to conclusions. So, I, you know, that kind of just jumps to my mind when thinking of these situations. And because I imagine these landowners, that they're going to jump to conclusions, they're going to immediately imagine the worst case scenario. But if I may, I'm. Look, I don't have the power of eminent domain, so the Railroad Commission, we don't, we don't control that. Um, so this is more anecdotal from my experience. Uh, nobody likes eminent domain. I mean, at the end of the day, as a, as, a, as a group of people, right, we recognize when you're going to build new roads or power lines or water mains, um, there, there's going to come a point where there's static, and unfortunately eminent domain is, is a part of that process, I guess. And once again, I don't have any authority over that, but um, I think we recognize that. But you know, I, once again, I live in a neighborhood where a pipeline goes right through there, and there, there are good stories, too. Uh, my neighbor just last week was like, man, 
They came in and built a pipeline across the back of our property. I got a check for X number of dollars out of nowhere, right? Like, and because the operator was trying to avoid eminent domain, they're trying to buy all these things. And so there's, there's plus size in those things being built. But at the end of the day, you know, when, when even one landowner, the, the people that you're talking about, feel like they, there weren't options and they were, um, that, you know, that they were getting the raw end of the deal. I mean, that's, once again, no one likes that. And you know that the oil and gas companies feel very, fr don't, don't like to get in that situation either. Give the, yeah, the questions, give them to Jennifer. Yeah. Sorry. No, that was it. I was just going to say, I think that, you know, there's just, as you said, there's perceptions, there's concerns, but, and there's good sides, but there's also challenges, and that, that's why your group is working on what it is. Tail end, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and we've got some audience questions. Um, they are all for you, Commissioner. Shocking. <laughs> it says, uh, this one is, um, how can you say the legislature is supportive of the Railroad Commission and TCEQ when they are about to cut TCEQ funds by about 21%? So first of all, I didn't say they were supportive of TCEQ. Not that I don't think they are, I just don't know. I haven't followed that process. I'm sorry if there's details I can get to answer some of these questions, I'll work on that. I just didn't, didn't research that today. Okay. Uh, and also, I guess, what, what role do you see for landowners in the complaint and resolution process? Currently for landowners, there doesn't seem to be a role. That is something that I tend to hear from landowners, too, that they, they may call if they see a problem or, or smell something weird, and then it's like that sort of, they're not sure what happens to it next. It kind of gets, it goes into the void, and then they don't know how to, um, you know, follow up and, you know, if anybody's following through. So, you know, I guess what role, it, and this probably applies to Laura as well, as to where you think people should should be included in that process. Is that the first? Um, I, I'm sure. <laughs> I've done a lot of talking to so. <laughs> uh, That is a, a frustration that we hear from a lot of members is um, sort of a lack of transparency and a lack of ability for landowners and complainants to really meaningfully participate in the process. So they file a complaint and then you'd have to file um, an open records request to get information on whatever happened to it. So that's an area we would like to see a little improvement. There's one example that's relevant here in terms of transparency for the Bluestone injection permit in Fort Worth, for instance, there was no requirement that adjacent landowners had to be uh, notified at all. You just had to run a, a public notice in some paper that was in the county somewhere. You probably run into this. They run it in maybe an obscure paper nobody ever reads. It comes out once a week instead of the daily or something like that. But there's no requirement that you notify adjacent landowners. on something as huge as that, it seems like that's a basic transparency or public right to know requirement that would be built in, but it's not. So there is. And... Um, Lots of different parties are required to be notified in our process. So part of one of those is any surface landowner who's directly connected to the well, uh, anybody who has minerals that could be affected by the well, um, water, groundwater conservation groups. Um, but not, it's not like a drill permit where people within 600 feet or a certain radius are notified in the neighborhood. It's not the same notification. Actually, it's quite similar. Um, quite similar, but not the same. It leaves out a lot. So yeah, there's a, there's a requirement to notify a bunch of different people. They have to demonstrate that they've done that notification. They have to put that notification in a, um, in a, in a publication. And it can't be an obscure public publication. I understand that in the Blue Sun case, they went to the Dallas Morning News, so, which is the biggest publication in the state of Texas. Um, so there's, there's a number of, of things they have to do to, to, to say, hey, we've made this, we've, we've made this thing public. And then there's a opportunity for anybody to protest. Now, there, when you mentioned a minute ago, I guess there's a couple of different ways that people get involved. One is when a new process is being permitted, someone requests a permit, an operator or a producer or whatever, and then when they request that permit, that's when notification goes out to all different groups, goes in the public record, and then people have an opportunity to protest. If there is a protestant, then the Railroad Commission, we talked about this last night, as a matter of fact, the Railroad Commission says, okay, operator, would you like to proceed, even though there's a protest? If he says yes, he's got 30 days to request a hearing at which anybody who has standing and is a protestant can come in and make their case. The cool thing, actually, I'll tell you about the Railroad Commission is unlike a court of law, the cost of presenting your case, while not as cheap as we'd like them to be, is much more affordable. 
So people can come in and express their concern, ask about safety issues, and in the Railroad Commission's case, unlike a, unlike a judge in a, in a legal case where they have to, the judge in a, in a civil case, for example, has to simply decide from the cases that are presented, our examiners, their charges to make sure it's safe as well. So we've heard feedback from people who come into a hearing and say, you know, we were concerned, but we, we weren't sure what questions to ask, but then your examiner asked questions to, to make sure to, of the person requesting the permit to make sure that they were getting answers to their questions. So there's some good things about our process that are different than the administrative, or sorry, than the civil court process. But long way of saying, that, that's how they engage in that process, to, to say, hey, these are our concerns where we think it may not be safe. And we talked about some of the areas specifically that we look at last night, and this is all on our, in our rules, the areas that the Railroad Commission evaluates. Then once something is goes into operation, then someone can complain or say, hey, I've got a concern, I saw this spill, I saw whatever. We respond to 100% of those. So if someone says, hey, I think there's a spill or I think there's something that's leaking, 100% of the time, our inspectors go out and examine what's happening. In, in a field. timely manner, not a week or two later? Um, it is typically within 48 hours. Now, I don't know that it's every the, single time. I don't think the Sunset time, Commission but, agrees with you on that, but okay. So yes, it's a, we make that the top of our priority list when we hear it, because right now we, we gauge them. If someone says, hey, the signs aren't correct anymore, which is a complaint we will get, then we may not do that within 48 hours. But all the ones that uh, are associated with risk, we put those at the top of our inspector list. They'll be the top of their list the next day. Um, and then once we find something, if, if there is anything of concern or anything that happens, um, depending on how what, what the issue is, what data we get, we will inform the landowner. But, once again, I talked before, opportunities for us to stay in contact with, with, with people about what's happening in their, in their neighborhood, in their area, in their backyard is something we can improve on or work on. So we have a, another audience question uh, dealing with some money that is, uh, it sounds like in this House and Senate budget right now to set aside about $3 million for IT upgrades with the understanding that it would be spent on improving data access and helping people kind of follow these complaints through whether it's, you know, their own land or their neighbors or, or just a I think company. It's SB5, They're SB5. curious. Yeah. So if, if that money comes to the if that money, you know, makes it through the session and, and gets earmarked, would I guess the question is, would is that how it would be spent? Could can you commit to making, you know, I guess a statement that it would go towards maybe improving that clarity uh, for people who are trying to keep up with some of the different issues. So yes, if that money's approved, it will be spent on IT upgrades in database format. Now, a couple things about this. Part of it is to make the data more searchable. So it's not, it's not that it necessarily is clearer, just that it's easier to find, easier to search. We've got some pretty archaic databases. Um, yeah, you've got a lot of there. information hidden in there. <laughs> so <laughs> are y'all officially in favor of that Senate bill then, that, that is targeting money for yes. that purpose? Yeah. Good. Um, we we want to make these IT upgrades, and lots of them, actually. Um, and so this is one of them. Yeah, we'd like to make databases easier to search. And I don't I, I, I don't want to speak about every, I don't remember every component of that bill, but they all, basically, if there's an IT upgrade, we request it. It's not that the Senate just asked for it. We requested all of those. Sorry, that was my question. I don't think it was asked in the way that I wanted it to be asked. Um, what I was asking is, essentially, can you make a public commitment today I think the answer is yes, but let me say it very specifically. I'll absolutely make the commitment. If that money is allocated to us, we're going to do exactly what's in that Senate bill. So I'm not sure if that was any different than what you just asked, but... It's not exactly a Senate bill. We're talking about an extraordinary item request in the Senate budget. The Senate, um... There's a line item in the Appropriations Bill. Right. Yes. If the, whatever, whatever funding... We, and look, we don't have a choice. We can't... Every dollar that gets allocated to us is put into very specific buckets. And very little of it is fun, can we move around? So everything, I mean, I can make a public, a public commitment because it's state law. We'll spend the dollars however the Senate tells us that we can spend those dollars. And in this case, this particular line item about improving our, um, our enforcement tracking and our database tracking, absolutely, that's why we requested it. And I have another, there's another question that comes from the audience about tracking radioactive waste and, and if 
there's the inability to provide some more information that would be helpful to industry or to people to know where it's moving around. I'm sorry, I can't, I, I'm not reading it probably right. Okay. I well, I couldn't read the handwriting. <laughs> so I was, sorry, I was I was trying to interpret. Until we're all telepathic. Yeah. Um, or norm. Sure. I think the question is, why don't, why doesn't the Railroad Commission require all water injection to have a radioactive tracer put in it so you can follow the flow of the fluid once it's in the, whatever formation you're injecting it? So, I haven't actually had that question before, so I, I <laughs> that's, well, sure, consider it. I said I'm thinking off the, the, shoot for the hip here a little bit, so forgive me. Um, one of the things that happens is when you look at, for example, this area, the Ellenberger is the big formation. We talked about this last night. It's a couple thousand feet thick. It runs for hundreds of miles. I mean, radioactive tracers last forever. I mean, relatively speaking, right? So, if as I'm thinking about why, what the concerns might be, just from my perspective, is eventually radioactive tracers will be everywhere. I mean, eventually it will it'll migrate through those formations. And so, what does that tell us? If it over five years moves somewhere down, further down into the into the reservoir, into the, the formation, unless of course we were worried about it coming up through like a, a an old well that was in one of the things the railroad commission looks at is when you're requesting a permit for a disposal well, and when you dispose of that zone, there are solid impermeable formations above that that we make sure are holding fluids down into that zone, and if we were worried about fluids coming up through an old well or some other hole, then we may, we may do something like that. And they do that today. So when they're, when they're running frack jobs or they're running disposal operations and they are concerned about tracking that, operators will do that on their own. So I don't, it's kind of a rambling here, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure, I would have to figure out, does, does it really add value or do we end up with kind of subtle radioactive tracers everywhere and it doesn't tell us a lot. But Actually, I think you could probably tag the waste from every injection well individually so you could actually individually tag that waste. Can you not do that? This the, problem, the, uh, the, the, the technology between tracer, with tracers is extremely advanced. I mean, I was at this uh, Permian Basin conference a couple weeks ago, and I think one of the gas industry uses it very commonly, and I mean, they can do, see, do some amazing communication of what's going on there based on, on where tracers are, are placed. So the technology is there. It's very advanced and it's, it's uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be radioactivity. Uh, there's many different ways that you can detect these compounds. I, I don't think, I mean, from our interaction with, you know, and these are limited, but with people running saltwater disposal wells, and it's certainly not, um, not working with that technology at this point. I mean, and, and maybe there is, I do think there would be a lot of value with that uh, to be able to I think it's most important over the short term that there's not uh, something doesn't go awry of what was planned in terms of where you tried to place that stuff. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. Like I said, I've never heard that one before, but I think, I mean. yeah. Okay. Well, I think we are we are way out of time, but oh. thank you very much to the <laughs> the panelists, and thank you for all of the great questions this week. As I said, I've got some time, so I'll hang out if anybody would like to visit and ask some questions that we didn't get to answer.